Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Pisa Presents Mastodon or Mammoth. This one's going to be a little bit different, but first some serious thanks to all our viewers and fans all throughout the world because when this is uploaded, this is actually going to be our 50th video on our YouTube channel. And well, <laughs> it's been a bit of a ride, but you know what? I'm darn proud of what we've accomplished as a club and then individually myself for the past how long. So thank you very much for all those that have given their support, have worked towards us in the channel. And without further ado, let's enter into the wonderful, wonderful world of, well, a quick warning here first, but okay. So Pleistocene Elephants Arm Parade. So here we go, folks. Because what is life if not something for you to have a little bit of fun? Now, okay, so Mammoth and Mastodon, we're gonna compare and contrast the two as they've been throughout time. Now, first of all, ancestors of modern elephants and mammoths really in general, split about five million years ago. Now that chart right there is very, very highly subjective because this is paleontology and things change pretty frequently and people like to argue. Now Mastodon ancestors themselves branched pretty long ago actually, about 25 to 27 million years ago. You can actually see back there the Mastodon split away much, much, much earlier than mammoths did, and actually still much earlier than African elephants did. Now, first of all, how do they get these names? Well, mastodon means breast tooth. It's a reflection of just the shape of their teeth is kind of like a human bosom. Now, mammoth, while mammoth is indeed another word for large, how or whether or not that is actually a relate direct relationship to the name itself, how it got its name is a matter of sort of conjecture. Mammoth could also be a anglicization of a word mammut, which can mean something in Siberia, referencing actually their very long tusks. Now that would obviously predate the use of mammoth as a term, meaning to use something large. So people aren't really sure. Some say that, well, yes, it is another word for large. Others say that the word mammoth came from, comes from this Siberian term, referencing their very long, famously curved tusks. Now, mammoths were around from about 5 million years ago to 3,700 years ago. Many species were not around at that 5 million year mark. I mean, there was one that arose from about 5 to some will tell you 6.2 to 6.3 million years ago, but a lot were more recent. Now, you didn't have as many species of mastodons as you did mammoths, although even that is up to conjecture. We'll get into that later. They went extinct about 11,000 years ago, and they first an actual established species of mastodon first appeared in the Miocene about 23 million years ago. So while yes, did say earlier that their ancestors appeared several million years beforehand, keep in mind that once you start to see the beginnings of a species, it's not like boom within five minutes. Hey, you got a baby mastodon. No, evolution moves uh, very, very slowly. And while, yes, to paraphrase Professor X, sometimes evolution does move a lot forward, but not in this case. So there are important mammoth sites in Africa, Asia, Europe, and North America. Now, Mammothus primigenius was the last to evolve about 400,000 years ago in Asia, and its last population was living on Wrangel Island out in the Arctic Ocean. Mastodons are found in Asia, Europe, Central, and North America. They're actually found very locally. Now, there are currently 10 recognized mammoth species. Some of the famous ones, Columbian mammoth, pygmy mammoth, our friend the woolly mammoth, which, by the way, I haven't been able to get a very concise answer as to whether or not woolly is spelled with one L or twos. Some people will say yes, some people will say expressly no, so I guess follow your heart. Now this right here is definitely inarguably the most famous of all these elephantine species from back in the day, the absolutely wonderful woolly mammoth. Now this is a still of a 
pretty famous display in the Royal Victoria Museum, but whenever I see this, there's only one gosh darn thing that I can think of, and maybe it's like the early 80s kid in me, but still, you can't tell me that doesn't look like Simba getting held over a rock. At least that's what it always reminds me of, and whenever I look at that picture, I see like that, you know, the chant that they give in the beginning of The Lion King. Now, maybe asking, well, self. How big are these animals? And well, self, I'll let you know. That is also a little bit subjective. Now, it depends also too on the species. Obviously, your pygmy mammoth species, like that orange one down there, aren't nearly as tall as the other ones. Now, each one of those units on the left is about three foot tall. So say you're looking at the woolly mammoth is right there, but then the Colombian mammoth, and then even past that, you know, they're a little bit bigger. While some sources may have you think that the woolly mammoth wasn't very big, and while, yes, it was definitely no pushover, it actually indeed was not the largest of the mammoths. So that is kind of true. Now, here is a skeleton of a mammoth right there, and notice the big domed shape to the forehead. That's very characteristic. So mastodons, anywhere from four to over 10 accepted species. And again, all the Dr. Evil implied air quotes you can get with that because, oh boy, there's a lot of arguing over how many expect accepted species of mastodons there are. Now, the most famous is the American mastodon, which were about, if they were female, seven foot high. If they were male, 10 foot high. And the same thing in general holds to mammoths, by the way. Males were typically larger than females. Now here is a skeleton of them and actually the, the very last one that we mentioned. And also too, notice you don't have that dome shape to the head. Now right here is, of course, throughout history, this is obviously from the drawing of Woolly Mammoth. Now, Mammoths, mastodons, they've been portrayed in human art and culture for really millennia, ever since somebody decided to pick up some ochre and do like a cave painting. So it's very, very fascinating if you look into some of these drawings and just you see how absolutely recognizable and iconic these animals are. They're probably one of the most famous fossil species in all of North America, if not the entire world. So now their teeth, obviously very famous. So the mammoth ones, classic, very, very ridged teeth, very easy to spot. They're good at grinding up tough grasses that they ate. Now mastodons typically had shorter legs, a longer body, but they were more muscled. They had their flatter head and their teeth were for pulling leaves. It wasn't for grinding, it was for pulling things. So that's why you had the shape of their teeth right there. Now their heads again. So as mammoths continue to evolve, their skulls shortened and rose. It developed a bony, some paleontologists call it a dome, some call it a dome piece. They also had a large amount of fat on their back. That is theorized to much like how camels carry nutrients on them. And again, it's theorized because we can never really definitively prove this. It's theorized that mammoths carried that as a source of nutrients to kind of stave them over in case, you know, they couldn't eat or something for a while. Now, some mastodons, like right below, had tusks on their chin. Now, that species there obviously did not, but typically their tusks are straighter than a mammoth, which have usually that very, very strong C curve to them. Now, there are lots of different famous mammoths, mastodons have been pulled up in the permafrost. They're still estimated to be, if we could probably somehow magically like get them all out of the permafrost right now, some people will guess that there's upwards of a million of them in Siberia. I don't think there's nearly that amount, but point being, there's a whole heck ton of them. How many, you can never really tell. There are apocryphal stories of certain indigenous tribes in the north about how they would use like mammoth and mastodon skins. They would find them in the ice and they would use them for certain rituals. And also the tusks could have a sacred uh, capacity to them. Now this one right here is Layuba. She was found in Siberia in 2007. 
a baby mammoth is actually a mammoth mummy she's classified as an ice mummy now pleistocene megafauna everywhere and bonus points if you actually sing that at home but yes they have been found in quite a few locations and quite a few fossil sites with the most famous by far and away the La Brea tar pits which is really interesting because you're driving around Los Angeles if you ever if you've never been there and then all of a sudden boom it just there's like big huge you know displays everything everywhere parking area it's just very interesting having this in the middle of such an area like LA I just man that place was such an honor to see it was great now a little interesting fact that we'll explain in a bit is roughly about 70% to three quarters of mammoth and mastodon fossils found at large sites are actually, or just in general actually, are male. So why is that? Well, think of a guess and pause for a little second when we look into a couple other more fossil areas. So what a lot of these fossil sites have in common is, is that they're not necessarily, as the song says, an unusual view. Many of these fossil sites have a lot in common. There are sites with, say, the tar pits or salt traps. It's something like that. It's something, it's a hazard, some sort of trap, something that attracts the animal and then ensnares them and they can't get out. Other famous fossil sites that is in... I believe Kentucky is been Bone Lick State Park, which yes, that is its actual name. I was talking about this to a coworker today and they did not believe me. There's other fossil sites in South Dakota and regionally you can find either one, Mammoth or Mastodon, in New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and really all around this country. So now these groups were matriarchal, mammoth or mastodon, which means adult females and young live together. Because of that, the males live mostly solitary, which is why you find most of the fossils are male because they were the ones that were more prone to just be like, oh crap, I stepped into a tar pit or they got injured, made a mistake, say they were the ones most likely to be singled out and possibly eaten or predated. And also, too, now with, uh, again, with mastodons, their tusks are a little bit straighter than a mammoth. And then on right here, you have a projected mastodon with fur. Whether or not mastodons have fur is something that's up to a bit of a debate still. And while, yes, we do have the preserved remains of some of these animals, how big and thick the fur was is something that's kind of argued still. Now, altogether, just in case you're wondering, mastodons had a gestation of 21 months with mammoths a close second at 22 months, after which they had most likely a single calf. In very rare instances, there is some evidence for twins. Now, coat color and thickness of either species varied. Mastodons typically had shorter brown hair. Maybe, like we said earlier, it's kind of up to debate. Now, mammoths on the left, both those are actually mammoth hair. The one down on the bottom is a mammoth leg from a baby mammoth. You're probably looking at that like, what in God's name is that? It's the leg off of a baby mammoth. You can find almost anything in public access images on the internet now. It's both scary and very enlightening at the same time. Now, why can you get such a variety of color in mammoths? Well, they had this gene, MCLR, that controls color, much like eye color or hair color in humans. If you had one copy of this gene, you got dark hair. If you were a cut mammoth with two copies, you got blonde or red hair. Now, obviously, both of these creatures, well, groups of creatures, that is, are extinct. So there are several ideas that have been brought forth to this, climate change, competition, hunting, uh, probably most people bring about a combination of all three instead of just one, just one absolute smoking gun. And yes, species have been found with what are cut marks on the bone, implying that the meat, the flesh was basically filleted and cut away from the bone, presumably for food. So that has indeed happened. So, but again, to what extent humankind had to predate 
uh, predate upon and make a lot of these animals extinct is up to debate, but it is a pretty sizable one. Still, all the same, there is a guy out in the Russia, Siberia area that is building something. He's working on it called Pleistocene Park, which is, if you haven't heard, that is more or less, he has all of this land out there and he is basically retro engineering going close and close as he can to the original gene pool of various Pleistocene megafauna animals, one of which is actually the woolly mammoth. He's trying to basically bring, he started with elephant DNA and then as various preserved specimens of mammoth have come forward, he's able to get the, this guy must be mad connected, he gets the hair from these specimens and then gradually he's trying to get, he'll never get 100% complete, but allegedly he's still saying how long this is going to take, he keeps on changing his estimates, but we may or may not have a Pleistocene version of Jurassic Park, and whether or not that's a good thing, eh, I don't really think it is. But all the same, I leave you again with this wonderful image. So thank you very much, folks, again, and uh, once more, I can't thank you all enough for <laughs> all of the wonderful support that you guys have shown to the club and the channel these past 50 videos on YouTube. 